Good afternoon. This is Pat Sheranian, and my guest today is Janice Weinheimer. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for having me. We're going to have a very interesting and very heartfelt subject today, and we invite you to stay tuned with us and uh, to see what unfolds in the book that you have written. It is a story, basically, of your life. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> Our sponsor today is Kayani, K-Y-A-N-I. And I want to share with you the most exciting experience I've had health-wise in the past 15 years. In July 2010, I had the opportunity to start using the three Kayani products every day. Within weeks, the medication I was taking for adult onset diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol, cholesterol were no longer needed. I now experience normal blood sugars, blood pressure, and cholesterol, and have for the past 18 months. My life has changed all for the better. Plus, the pain from arthritis is gone, and I have the energy of a person years younger. It has been amazing and wonderful for me, and I would wish that for you. If you are sick and tired of being sick and tired, give Kayani a try. It is 100% guaranteed. Please contact me in our chat room, pat.utahvalleylive.com, and leave your name and your phone number in on my phone, which is 801-362-9552, and I'll get back to you with answers or comments, uh, whatever you might need to know about this product. We can go more in detail, or I'm on every day talking about Kayani at 9 a.m. Utah time on the streaming video, pat.utahvalleylive.com. Thank you, and thank you for being with us. We appreciate it. We've had a little bit of a technical problem this morning that we think we've resolved, and let's just move forth like we're going to be okay. 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 Um, I want to start out because this book is, I can hold this up and they can see it on the streaming video, but not the radio station. The name of it is The Illness That Healed Me. It's an account of surviving sexual abuse and the journey into healing. It's a big book. It's a, a heartfelt, pain-filled, and recovery book. But before we start reading out of the book, which I'll turn this way for our viewing audience, but uh, this is available. Uh, is it on Amazon? Can you get it on Amazon? I'm on Amazon and Barnes and Noble online. Okay. And again, the title is The Illness That Healed Me, and it's by Janice Weinheimer. And you, if you have been in a situation or have a loved one that has been in the situation that Janice has been in, this is a remarkable book, and you're going to want to read it and share the information with folks in your family or your acquaintance that may need the information here. So Janice, let's start right out and find out who you are. Let's uh, talk about where were you raised, where you're from, and then we'll go into how all of this started and the journey through. And we've got about uh, 45 minutes or so to do that. So let's go through the, the process and start with thank goodness you're here. Okay, uh, I was actually born in Pocatello, Idaho, and uh, we moved from there when I was five years old to North Salt Lake and into Utah, and I grew up there, and <clears throat> I always was afraid, and I didn't know why, I didn't understand that, a very shy, withdrawn, introverted child, and all these things just uh, kept me from really achieving in a lot of ways and, and the fears kept me even in family I wouldn't talk unless it was just one-on-one -on -one with a sibling I didn't do that much talking and I we moved to Lehigh uh, when I was 10 and I grew up in Lehigh went to Lehigh High School and when I was 16 uh, my parents moved back to Salt Lake and uh, I didn't want to go. I wanted to finish high school. In oh, Lehigh. Sure. It was my senior year. And one of my friends said to me, uh, told me about uh, being able to enter the University of Utah early admissions through the Ford Foundation program. And so when my parents wouldn't let me go live with my brother in Lehigh <coughs> to finish that year, uh, I went up and applied at the University of Utah. I was accepted, so I started college at the University of Utah when I was 16. I transferred after my first year to Brigham Young University, where I graduated at age 20. I met my husband the, that same year and uh, at Christmas time, 
and we were married that summer in June, and nine months later to the day, I had my first <laughs> child. <laughs> and two years later, we had a set of twins, a boy and a girl. And two years later, we had another set of twins, uh, boys. And two years later, we had a set of triplets. No, you didn't. Girls. I did not know. Th I did not know this about her. I did not know this. She didn't want to know. It. <laughs> <laughs> so I had seven children in four years, and then we lost a multiple birth. And two years later, and two years later, I had a single girl. So I had a singleton at each end. And this became the... But what is that, nine children? Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, the, the multiples were all premature, and the triplets especially were born two months early. I'd had to go to bed because of hemorrhaging, and spent the majority of the time in bed. And I was monstrous. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the babies were, their backbones were lined up you know, one, two, three, and so, and I had to carry them that way, and they were hung low, and the doctor said he, I was the first person he'd ever seen that had to have babies come uphill to come out, <laughs> so it was difficult on my body, I and guess. difficult when they arrived, because I had all these little children, and from my experiences and tuning into that inner voice, <clears throat> I learned to use my children to help me around the house. The six-year-old had to prepare meals because when I had three premature babies that had to be fed and it took an hour to feed each one, when I got through with the third one, I had to start in again. They were on a three-hour schedule. So it took 24 hours a day to feed them, except my husband came home and then he would assist me and we didn't have help in the beginning. And so I organized the children as I was guided and prompted to help me in the house. And uh, my four-year-old twin boy washed all of our dishes by hand. We didn't have a dishwasher. And he'd climb up on a little stool, and we only had one sink, and I can see him yet with dishwater up <laughs> to his <laughs> elbows. And yes, he broke quite a few dishes, and we learned to replace those with unbreakables, but he washed all of our dishes for a family of ten three times a day and took care of that. That was his job. And his twin sister vacuumed. She folded the diapers. Did you work this out as a chart? Did they just, you asked them to do it and they... I had it, I didn't even have time to make a chart. It came to me in my head as I was feeding babies. I had a lot of time to think, just yeah. couldn't do <laughs> a lot. So I had a lot of time to think and so I organized them. And you know, it was a really happy time in our family because they kids, were, kids that age want to help. They and do. they were they playing help. house. Yeah. But they were using real babies, real um, dishes, real food, and all these things, you know. And they didn't know they were working until they went to school and their uh, friends told them. Then they weren't ever as good to do it again. But at that time, there was a very special spirit in our home. Years later, uh, this became the foundation for my first book. Uh, because people asked me, how did you do it? What did you do? How did you, you know, they wanted to know the ins and outs. I started speaking out a lot about it. And so I didn't feel like I was a writer uh, because of an experience I had when I was in second grade. I used to write, I love fairy tales, and I wrote a book of fairy tales. And one of my siblings came in and made fun of me and said, ha, 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 you think you're a writer. And it tore my heart apart. And I took that book of fairy tales, ran down the stairs, opened up the furnace door, coal furnace, and threw that book in and burned it. And from then on, I knew I couldn't write. So I never tried to write. But when I was 18, a lot of us have had experiences like that where we were young enough and innocent enough that somebody may be older we thought was an authority voice. And so we threw away our gifts and talents and almost made the promise to never go seek them again because it's a painful experience. When I uh, was 18, I had an experience sitting in church and it was like a mini vision opened up to me and I knew that someday I was going to write a book and so when people kept asking me about these experiences and you know can't you write it down and so I tried to originally I tried to write something else that didn't work but my daughter 
who is gifted as a writer, uh, was taking creative writing. We'd moved to Phoenix at this time, and she was taking creative writing from uh, our bishop, actually, who was the local uh, uh, writing teacher. And she said, why don't you come? Because she knew about this experience I'd had. Why don't you come and go to bishop class with us? And I said, no, I'm not going to high school at this time in my life. <laughs> but I was working registration at the community college and I was sitting there with his wife. And he came out and talked to her. And so I asked him, I said, how do you write a book? And he just said a couple of things. I started taking notes. And he said, you're serious, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. So then he taught me and gave me things to do, and he kind of guided me along the pathway. And uh, as I started writing, he checked it, but he never really made many changes or anything at all. So anyway, this was the foundation of my first book, Families Are Forever, if I can just get through today. And it became a, a well-known uh, accepted book by Deseret Book, was, sold lots of books, and I got on the writing, uh, the talking. You know, I was speaking all over the western United States and Canada. And because it was on multiples, I was also asked by Mothers of Twin Club, the State uh, Mothers of Multiples Convention, the National Convention for the Mothers of Twins. What were you doing with your kids all this time? You've still got a house full of kids. I still took care of them and still used the kids <laughs> to help organize. But, of course, they grew up fast. I had eight teenagers at once, you oh, know. That's so a choice uh, experience. They, because they were so close. And I was not really good with little children, but my husband was. And I was excellent with teenagers. We had a good time. I just felt like I had a whole house full of friends all the time they were there. So we had a great time, and the book did well. And because I was on the speaking circuit and going just, you know, all the time and fulfilling many callings in the church, I, in 1988, became deathly ill. I woke up, it was January the 5th, 1988, and I woke up at 6, and I was lying on my left side, and I was perfectly fine. I was flying out to Denver that day because I had two speaking engagements in Denver and one in Colorado Springs the next night, and I turned on my right side, and my whole world caved in. What happened? I had no equilibrium. I was so dizzy and nauseated, the room just whirled with my eyes closed. That didn't stop for Is that six. Vertigo? It's a type of vertigo? Uh, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I couldn't even go to the restroom without my husband and my daughter, one on either side, to get me there. And that was the illness. And I actually sat straight up. They tied me into an early American couch. And I sat up with my legs straight out day and night for five months. Totally. I, I couldn't function. The, the dizziness, the di to prevent the dizziness, is that Oh, right? it didn't stop it, but if I moved, it intensified it so badly that I just, I didn't think I could exist. Well, in fact, the first six weeks, because I didn't sleep day or night, I, I prayed a thousand times a day, please just let me die, please just let me die. I couldn't deal with it. And after six weeks, I got the message that I wasn't going to die. And Nobody could find anything wrong with me. I went to every kind of specialist, mm. you know, four ear, nose, and throat men, four neurosurgeons, neurologists, they had MRIs, CAT scans, x-rays. They could not find one single thing wrong with me. No one could help me. They did every test they could think of, and nothing helped. So after six weeks, I just had to take a look at myself and say, What's going on? What is this? And I decided that God was giving me a stop sign, that I wasn't going the direction that he wanted me to go. And I, had, I, I spent those five months doing soul searching because you can't, when you don't sleep and all you've got is your mind, I couldn't talk, I was so ill. I couldn't even open my mouth. If I opened my mouth, I threw up. So I didn't open my mouth. It was just death. And like I say, with my eyes closed, the room whirled constantly. Nothing, you know, to take that away. I've experienced a little bit of that with vertigo, where I've had a couple, three or four days that were really bad. And it's true. As long as I was lying absolutely flat and did not open my eyes, things were still. The minute I opened my eyes, the room was just rolling. 
Well, mine never stopped. I even can't, with I my can't own. even imagine. I really can't because what I went through was horrible. Your life stops. And to have it for that extended period of time, you almost disassociate with what's going on around you because you're no longer a part of it. Uh, your f whole focus is just, oh, you know, trying to feel better and not move because it intensifies so much greater. And doctors tried to give me medication for it, and it just made it worse. Nothing they gave me worked. Mm. And they gave me uh, patches, you know, to put behind my ear for it. And I, ha I had my husband take them off. It just made it so much worse. Mm. So n there was no relief. And finally, after all that time, I began to pray for peace because I remembered some scriptures that spoke to my heart. And I thought, okay, if I've got to go on living, I've got to have peace or I can't exist. And so when I began to pray for peace, it began to ease a little. Not the illness, but my ability to deal with it was better. I wasn't so stressed. I, I surrendered. You, you about have to when you're in a condition like that, I would think, because where do you go? You have one source. There was nothing I could do, and, and God wasn't giving me <laughs> any reprieves. And it was so funny. Well, it wasn't funny, but my youngest daughter, who quit her job to come home and stay with me and take care of me, would come in at night and lie on the floor crying. And she said, please, God, don't let my mother die. And here I was praying, please, God, let me die. <laughs> so I've joked. It had to be a terrible time. Since then, that her prayers were stronger than mine. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an... Uh, a revolution, a very oh, eye opener to me, because I had lived my life in the fast lane. I had done everything I thought that God wanted me to do, and I had tried everything. I tried to excel in everything. I just I'd learn things and I'd become the best, you know, at whatever. I, like I uh, became a seamstress and sewed for a. Uh, designer shop and I could make wedding dresses and things that uh, had a man in Egypt offer me two thousand dollars a dress if I would make them for him and I just told him no it was a labor of love I wasn't going to do <laughs> sewing for your children yeah but I did sew for people uh, just to help earn a little money but anyway that and cooking you know whatever it was I took it on and I, I became the best I've written some cookbooks and so this was my lifestyle. I just became a perfectionist in everything I did, thinking I was doing the right thing. But what God was teaching me was that I had created a persona that was totally based on exterior achievement, and that's not who I was. Wow. And I did not know who I was. Mm. I had no idea. You were a wife, you were a mother, you were a friend. Uh, you were, had siblings, but that is not who you really were. And it was just, I, I, I began to question. I didn't know, you know, who I was or where to go. And, of course, this took a long time. Actually, one doctor said to me, after so long, the brain says, hey, you know, we've got to make an adjustment here. And after five months, I, if I sat with my head tilted to the right, I could motate around holding my head, you know, up with my hands because my head became so heavy. I couldn't hold it. And I had to keep my head tilted. If I tried to straighten it up, it all came back again. Mm. And so I walked that way for quite a while. But, I, you know, little by little, things began to uh, ease. And 10 years later, I actually took some impact training that one of my friends got me into, a couple of them got me into, and it was in the impact training that the head trainer had had two near-death experiences, and he was harsh. He could see right through me. Was his name Hans? Yes. How did you know? I did not know this about her because I have also been through impact training. Yes, Hans was... Scare you to death when you first arrived. Well, not only that, but I mean, and not in the beginning, because he was very kind. When I got up to share, and he asked me things and found out about the sexual abuse in my life and 
things. He when I said he was very hard, it was very, with me, it was very quickly, stop kidding yourself, you know, be who you really are. Just because you're a CEO, is that who you are? It, you've been through the routine. I mean, it was, for some of us, impact training really worked because it, it got out of us the things that needed to be said, that need to be confronted. Uh, no, I was a person. I had a name and uh, not a title. And I'd lived on titles for a very long time. So it was a very huge eye-opener. Was he kind in the beginning? Yes. Did he get terribly tough with me? Yes, he did. Did I go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him and nose-to-nose? -nose? I did over a four-month period. Well, I didn't do that. But we came out on the other side of it, best friends. Because I was scared to death of him. You would have been. You would have been very frightened of him. And he could see right through me. And at looking back, now this is hindsight because I didn't see it. I just thought he hated me because I staffed so many of the trainings. And each time he would just ridicule me in front of everyone, which is something I couldn't deal with. You know, I had to be perfect in public. And so he was working on that ego, you know, trying to get me to see who I really was on the inside and not the persona I had created. That's it. And after so many times... Is I'd all this in this book, by the way? Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a whole chapter on impact training in there. Let me interrupt for just a second because I do want to give you this. It's called The Book by Janice Weinheimer, who is my guest today, is The Illness That Healed Me. And it is on Amazon. You can get it from Barnes and Noble. Do you have any idea what it costs? At this it's stage? twenty six ninety nine. Oh, well, it's not that much online. And it's Barnes and Noble less. online too. They okay, don't a little sell bit them. less online. Yeah, but in the twenty five dollar range, twenty to twenty five dollars. It's around somewhere. twenty, I think, okay. online. Um, it was written what year? In uh, well, it took twenty years to write. It was published in two thousand and ten. Okay, so it's a fairly new book. Mm -hmm. This has come out. And uh, we're grateful to have her here today to share with us. Our sponsor today is Kayani, K-Y-A-N-I. They're products that I take, and I have found them to be marvelous for me. I would wish that for you because they have changed my life in the most positive way. To get hold of uh, a number, to uh, here's the number to get hold of someone, and it's 801-362-9552. We'll try and answer your questions. 801-362-9552. We do have a chat room. Unfortunately, we can't take phone calls from the radio, but we do have a chat, chat room on the streaming uh, video at uh, pat.utahvalley.com. If you would like to, excuse me, it's pat.utahvalleylive.com. If you'd like to be in our chat room, we have somebody monitoring that. You're welcome to ask a question or make a comment. We'd be happy to address those as we go along. Okay, let's continue with your story. Okay, I, I like I said, I staffed, and and Hans just continued to ridicule me, and I'd go home just devastated. Didn't know how to deal with it, and um, I took all the trainings that they had. I went through their top train uh, trainer and training, and at the last day we had to do uh, uh, what do you call a module of some kind. Anyway, when I got up to do mine, I was so petrified. And I was so scared I forgot to signal the music person. And that's the way I figured out my time, because you had to have your timing right. And I, I just fouled up the whole thing. And he ridiculed me right in front of everyone. And I was so devastated. I went home at night, and that was the last day of training. And I said, I'm never going back there again. Well, my I hadn't had graduation yet, though. Had you gone through the graduation? Oh, yeah. All right, so they'd had that. Okay. So um, anyway, we had a reunion, what they called, and they'd come back in a month or two. And my daughter was also in the class. Uh, I got her in there because she'd been kidnapped off the school ground when she was six, when oh. a uh, hippie type tried to kill her. And she had a lot of problems in her life because of this. So I got her into the training also, and it really served her well. But she wanted to go to the reunion, and so I said, okay, I'd go with her. But there's no way I was going to get up and share. <laughs> well, she got up and shared, and Han said, last two. And I just sat there, you know, shivering. There's no way I'm getting up. He's not going to ridicule me. The next thing I knew, I was up there. 
I don't know how I got there, but I was up there, and I said something like, the last day of training, I had a huge uh, wake-up call for me. And I said, I don't know who I am. I don't know. My whole foundation is crumbling under me. I don't know who I am. And I heard Hans way in the background saying, finally. <laughs> and it was at that point I lost all of that persona. It was gone. I, it didn't serve me anymore, but I didn't know who Janice was. And I had lived my life totally in my head up to that point. I did not know how to feel in my heart. I didn't know how to relate to that. And at that point, uh, I was working at the Jewish synagogue. And my boss, who became my boss later on, uh, just knew how to work with me and knew how to teach me to love myself and to he was so you hadn't experienced those feelings any at all that i'm okay no. and i can love me no well i have to ask this if you don't love yourself i know from experience personal and outside of myself if a person cannot love themselves it's very very difficult for them to love someone else very difficult. That becomes just a shell. The words are simply words. They're not really loving. And so you must have been in an absolutely difficult spot. I can't imagine. I never felt loved all my life. And uh, I knew in my head how I was supposed to look. And so I, and I was a great, uh, I have great uh, ability to imagine things and so I could figure it out that way but my boss he died actually a brain tumor three years ago and he was only 47 but he the last day he was in the office called me in and when I went to leave he, he got up from his desk and came around and put his arm around my shoulder and looked at me you know face to face and he said I hope you know how much I love you not because you work for me but because of who you are. And it wasn't until then that I really felt like I was worth anything. And it had been all my life. Your whole life. And you this was three years ago. Oh, my goodness. So I had never experienced love until Ralphie gave me that love. And when he died, it was like, my whole light went out. I didn't know how to deal with that because I had a glimpse of this and then it was gone. But I feel his presence around me quite often when I uh, get down. He's, he's close by. Can you tell yourself that because one person loved you, maybe others love you and have loved you? I mean, do you know that or is it still just, they are still just words? My third therapist said to me, he said, you have built up such huge walls around your heart so that you wouldn't get hurt anymore that even God's love doesn't get through to you. Mm. And so I know that I, I mean, I know intellectually I did that, but it was the illness that healed me. And the reason I say healed me because it was a journey from my head to the heart. I That's had, a long trip sometimes, and it sounds it was like huge. you spent a lifetime traveling. It was huge, but I know who I am now, and I don't have to rely on externals anymore. If people don't like me, that's their problem. If they don't them accept me, you let them own it. I did learn that in yeah, the impact good. training. <laughs> good, you have to let them own it. Or, yeah. You know, they've got to own it. I, I experienced that. Sometimes I'm... Um, I quick to say something that perhaps I shouldn't have said and, and uh, didn't realize how it would affect the other person. But I've had to learn that, you know, you just try harder to do better. That some things you can't go back and fix. You can try, but you can't go back. But don't beat yourself up for it. And if you've learned that lesson, then you've taken a big step. When you it doesn't feeling, always happen. You, 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 still, you still have moments? <laughs> uh, yes, I have to talk myself through it sometimes and realize. And this is one thing that why I like that experience with Ralphie so much is because when I get down, I choose to focus on that experience with him. You just said the, the, really the word that, that the whole thing hangs on. It really does. These are choices. Yes. You can make choices. We have choices. Uh, they are mental and they're heart-pulled sometimes, but we can make a choice 
Uh, when you come to an intersection, you can decide to go through the green light, uh, or you can decide to uh, um, stop when you shouldn't and get hit from behind, or you can have a red light and you can go through it. We have choices. And it starts out sometimes that simple, the obvious, very simple. And then you begin to embrace it, embrace it and own that word. And you can choose to get up and have a good day. You can choose to be happy all day. You can choose to ignore things that people say when they're coming after you. And my personality is strong enough. I've had a few people take me on. And a long time ago, it bothered me. And I still have my moments under certain circumstances. And I have to think about it and, and evaluate the situation because we all have that vulnerable piece inside of us at some point because that little kid is still there. Oh, right. Whatever happened when we were little, coming along the ranks, there's still pieces in there that we're all working at. Some do better than others, and it comes at different stages. Sometimes a 10-year-old can get it put together. But when life interferes and comes along and really changes your thinking like yours, I have to believe you made some monumental choices. Oh, I had to. Uh, it, after the impact training and after my experience with Ralphie, and of course, all the I spent years. Now we've talked about all the problems, and I don't want to run out of time here because we need to go back to what created the symptoms that you've expressed and the things you felt. Uh, where did all this start when you finally peeled away all of the peelings, and now you're down to raw emotion? Well, it, like you say, it's a choice of either being a victim or a survivor, and I chose to be a survivor because yes. I had four perpetrators uh, when, I, when I was little. There were two uh, that sexually abused me, and I repressed that, so I didn't get the memory back until I was 53. But as a 12-year-old, a uh, lifeguard repeatedly raped me, and uh, after a couple of years, I felt like I was so worthless that I finally trusted someone, and I went to my seminary teacher and told him what had happened. And after four months, he crossed over the line and abused me, too, for two years. So those experiences say to you that you are worthless. And there's a scale of consciousness that one of the books I read, I've read tons of books. I bet you have. I bet uh, you have. To help me get over, because I had to go to alternative ways when the medical community couldn't help me get well. I had to find other ways, you know, to see what I could do. And this was a long, arduous experience. Well, plus, it was a time when not everybody would talk about this. It's still a subject that people are terrified to talk about. So that you had no one really, did you? I can't imagine you had a support group around you very much at that time. The only person I ever told was one of the girls when I was working at the resort. She was 20 and I was 12, and I told her what the lifeguard was doing, and she just said, if that's happening to you, it's your own fault. And so I learned. And that's how people used to look at it. I am thank goodness that times are changing and minds are changing, and decisions are being made now in, in uh, arenas that really count and uh, hopefully the laws will become tighter and tighter so that kids are protected and adults horrifying okay let's go see if we can get into that a little bit okay uh, one thing i wanted to uh, make note of was that uh, on a map of consciousness which dr david hawkins wrote the book power versus force and he listed uh power know, versus force mm -hmm. Okay. He listed human emotions on a scale of one to a thousand. Okay. And calibrated all these out, and uh, twenty was shame. And that this is, came out some years ago. Mm -hmm. I remember when this 90s. came out because it did. And they were they had a scale for divorce. They had something for illness. Something else for what happened immediately in your family. How. And everything was on a certain type of scale. You can calibrate anything. And, and pretty much people fall into categories with these particular problems mm -hmm. and situations. Okay, share yeah. that with us. Uh, well, um, it went from one to a thousand. Jesus is the only one uh, that calibrated at a thousand. Mother Teresa was over 700. Gandhi was over 700. But the big thing is there's a break off uh, below 200 are the lower frequencies, the lower energies that weaken you and above 200 are the higher frequencies which strengthen you 
And so you want to be above the 200. I lived most of my life under at, at 20, oh, my which goodness. is just a step above death. Oh, I started to say you're barely alive. And that's, and I, when I read Toxic Shame by um, John Bradshaw was one of the first books I read. Toxic Shame, mm -hmm. okay. And he talks about that. He was one of my first mentors. I, he was on TV at the time. Wouldn't you know, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. It's and uh, he was on at that time and I watched him. And it helped me a lot because I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do. Uh, the problem hasn't changed that much. People still don't know where to go. I know. Wait. That's one of the reasons for, for the, the book. book. Okay. Because I didn't want people to be so afraid. The Illness That Healed Me by my guest, uh, Janice Weinheimer. And she. this came out last year, and you can get it at Barnes & Noble. Online. And online at Amazon. And you named a couple other places. Just those two. Just those two. I mean, there's various bookstores, but well, I don't know. I'd, yeah. If you live in New York, Strands has it. Okay, <laughs> if you're in New York, well, they may, may have people in New York. That On the suggest. inside uh, jacket of the book, I put my uh, an email address where I can be reached oh, by good. anyone. So if you have the book, they can email you. Wonderful. They can reach me, and I will answer the emails the best I can. To Actually, them. I can read that maybe. Mm -hmm. um, it's Puggy, P-U-G-G-I-E. That's it. We talked 37. about that when I sent you an email. P-U-G-G-I-E 37 at Yahoo. Yep. P-U-G-G-I-E 37 at Yahoo. Okay, great. And you'll answer emails. I will. I'll okay. answer them because I know what I went through, uh, just keeping everything to myself, feeling like I was the most terrible person alive and there was everything was wrong with me. And... To, to put it on a scale so you can really understand it, if it were a report card, I felt like everyone else had A's and A pluses and I was always an F. Hmm. And if I tried my hardest, if I just achieved, you know, so many things, I might get to a D minus, but I never felt above a D minus. But in fact, you didn't get those grades. No, 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 no. no. You were achieving all the time. Oh, yeah, I had good grades. But somewhere inside of your head. It was just, I'm trying to explain how I felt so mm. you can realize that. No, I was the only one on the yearbook honor roll when I was a sophomore. I studied because this is something else. See, perfectionism. I wanted to be valedictorian. That was my goal. So I studied like you wouldn't believe. I stayed up until 2 o'clock in the morning studying. I got up at 5 o'clock and started studying again. I wasn't the smartest kid by far in school, but I studied so hard. And can you imagine the stress? I'd sit there with my teeth clenched, my fist clenched, every t test paper I got back for fear I wouldn't be the highest. And then when my parents moved, and no one knew except one friend that this was my goal, when they, they moved, it was gone. It was gone. And I had worked so hard for it and was ready for it. So, yeah, I achieved, but I never felt inside. So I'm going to go back because you talked about this that you had going on for months where you were practically in a stage of paralysis emotionally and physically. And you talk about this, was that the illness that did the healing? So you had to get sick. And then it had to, you had to face yourself. I had to hit rock bottom and where there was, there was no one there to was turn no to. There was no one to go to. You were now raw, yeah, absolutely but, raw. And so then I want to hear how you started building the stepping stones. Uh, well, after this one doctor. Because you're a perfectionist and you've got this dichotomy yeah, going on. I still hadn't yeah. lost that. I knew that uh, God didn't want me to go the way I had been going. And... Those five months took away all the, I had six months worth of speaking engagements, you know, ahead of time. And one by one, I had to let those go. And because that was uh, like a drug, you know, to me, it gave me that. Gave you a boost, made you yeah. feel high, made yeah. you feel good, a lot of energy around it. Okay. But it only lasted a couple of days, and then I needed another one. That's why I was killing myself. And so. You needed approval. Oh, big time. Applause recognition because okay. uh, I didn't approve of myself so I needed it from everyone else so it is as simple that's say it again because so many people struggle with this. I didn't approve of myself there was no uh, so many times I wished I could just disintegrate 
and just not, be gone. Yeah. I had a friend say to me a couple of years ago that she wanted to die but go into oblivion. And, you know, we believe there is a hereafter, that we go on. The things we learn here we take with us. And she didn't want to exist. She wanted to die and then just blow up and be particles and not be anyone. And I cannot imagine being in that place in your life. I can't. I've, I've never been there. And it's really hard to imagine the pain that accompanies those kinds of thoughts. Well, and you have to understand, too, that for most of those years, I didn't feel. I wouldn't allow myself to feel. So you, so didn't, I you buried, didn't cry, you didn't get angry, you didn't you didn't have up days or down days, you had blank days, emotionally. Well, I'd have a little, you know, but I didn't ever allow myself to feel because it was too painful. I couldn't feel. Mm. So I didn't deal with it, and I've had to deal with that since 1988. Boy. And... All that excess emotional baggage stored in me and what it did to my body. So anyway, I, the, what began was one day I was walking past uh, the counter and the newspaper was there and it uh, talked about the mind-body connection. And I couldn't read because it made me so deathly ill. I couldn't focus on anything. I couldn't even watch TV when I was so sick. I could have it on sometimes, but I couldn't read. I couldn't do anything with my eyes, nothing. And sometimes sounds would drive me crazy, so I couldn't even, you know. Existing must have been a chore. It, oh, it was hell. It was the dark night of the soul, literally. It was, it was hell, literally. <laughs> So anyway, I asked my husband to go to the library and see if his name was Dr. Rossi, if there was a book or something we could get that he could read to me. My husband was good and patient. He actually retired early to take care of me, and uh, he read to me so many books. And his sister told us about a book. So I hadn't heard about mind-body connection, and that started me off on the alternative way of healing. And then my sister-in-law told us about... Uh, um, Love, Medicine, and Miracles by Bernie Siegel, the cancer surgeon who shaved his head so right. that he could be like they were. And I began to learn uh, just little things from each book. And as one, I'd get through one book, another one would appear. And I must have I've read, well, that first year, he read to me everything. And it's harder when you have someone read to you, maybe not for an, one who's audio, but I'm visual. I have to see, and I couldn't see that. So and you I had eyes closed, and you were just listening. Wow. And I couldn't make notes, and I couldn't write in the margin, which I do with books. And so that was very, very difficult uh, for me. But eventually, I got to the point where I could read a little bit. I couldn't read very much. And I read a ton of books, which I listed, you know, a lot of them. And, of course, John Bradshaw's were among the top ones. Now, our, is all that information in the book? Mm -hmm. I'm going to encourage you to buy this book because we're going to run out of time. And I think you may be coming back next week with me, but we're going to run out of time again. So between now and then, perhaps you could buy the book. It's called The Illness That Healed Me. We're nowhere near through this account. And I'm going to interrupt you just a minute because you're, you've got a little uh, competition going on. Yes. And I'd like you to share that so that uh, it's only going to be for a few more days. Uh, but those of you that are listening can certainly be of benefit. So let's hear about it, Janice. Well, the author show, a uh, TV show, called and uh, asked me to be It's on. called The Author's Show? Uh, uh, you've got the information. I know, there. but I don't have my glasses. So well, <laughs> there, there you are. <laughs> okay. It's the, uh, you have to go, there. it's a contest. Uh, we had to write an essay. Uh, first of all, they interviewed me, and I was on the author's TV show, which is out of uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they put up, they write a book, and the new one's coming out, and so they want to put 50 authors in the book. So you had to write an essay to become one of the uh, finalists. I'm one of the 113 finalists. Uh, and then they have you vote. And so I ask people to go to the website to vote. And you go to uh, uh, the uh, www.authorswebtv.com. And to when you get there, you give it again, give it twice. www.authorswebtv.com. 
tv.com. Okay. And when you get to that uh, window, you see on the right side, there's a, a red seal like this. Okay. And uh, you click on that, and this takes you to a new window. And you scroll down to where you can either read the essays, uh, click on that, or click below that to vote. And this is where you go to vote. And when you scroll down, when you get to that window, you scroll down to the next to last name. That's mine. <laughs> and you just and let's spell it for a radio audience. W e i n h e i m e r. But if they can get the W e i n, they're on the right track. Right. And then they vote for you. Right. And if you win this thing, if you have the most votes, what happens? They well, get you in the book? At the 50 top finalists will okay. be in the book, and the, f the top one wins something. I don't even remember what it was. But anyway, I just felt like entering. So, so you did. So I did. That's a long way from where you were some <laughs> years ago, lady. Yeah, writing. A long even. Way. Right. And long even way. with the book, it took 20 years to write because of that incident when I was in second grade and not feeling like I could write and and not wanting to put all of that information forward to what, the public. What is the best part, the best thing that happened to you writing this book? And then what was the most awful part of it? Well, I'll, I'll do it in reverse. Okay. The hardest part was I'd sit to write and I'd get the feeling. And this is ego talking, chatting at me. I learned that, but it, it took a long time before I knew that. Mm -hmm. was, who do you think you are? Who do you think is going to listen to you? Who wants to read anything you've written? You know, and that chattering going on in your mind. And I couldn't write those it's called days. called self-talk and it can destroy you. Right. Yeah. And so those days, I just had to put it down, and then I wouldn't put it down for a day. I'd put it down for months and wouldn't go back to it until that inner nudging got so strong that I'd have to pick it up again. And even sometimes in the night, I'd wake up feeling like there were thousands of women around me waiting for me to get this out there. And I even heard voices telling me, write your book. And so I'd suck it up and go, and I'd sit and write. But what I did, and this is how the book was written, I'd go to my recliner chair, and I can't write on the computer. I'd take my notebook and my pencil. You're doing all this longhand? And I sat there, and that's 775 pages, double-spaced. <laughs> it's 500 in the 500 or 480, I think, there. But I sat there, and I had bowed my head, and I said, Okay, God, I'm here. If you want this book to be written, the rest is up to you. I have shown up. And then I would sit and wait until it started to come. And then I'd write as fast as I could write. So you write. really feel this is inspiration then? You can't call it anything else. And that's the way my first book was written. Oh. Only I wrote it out by the pool because we lived in Arizona. <laughs> An hour every day at the pool. But uh, that's how I have to write because it overrides the ego. You, you, it leaves, um, almost it leaves you without a choice when you're being pushed so hard from inside to get it done. And you've got that terrible conflict of you can't do it. And what do you think you're doing? And who do you think you are? So that was the best and the worst of times over 20 years. 20 years. The name of the book is The Illness That Healed Me. And it's an account of surviving sexual abuse and the journey into healing. And what a trip this has been. Where are you going now? Where, where are you in your life that you, um, you've accomplished a number of things that You've become a real person now. Um, how is how are things different for you and your just your family element from the way when you weren't feeling, when you didn't have feelings, when well, you couldn't express them? I'm more honest. <laughs> uh, I don't uh, try to just smooth things over. I tell them how it is, and uh, I think that's something my children had to learn too that I changed and I I say what I feel and sometimes that's not always easy for them to I think to accept but this is who I am this is what I think this is what I but believe. But they deserve honesty. Yes. They deserve and <clears throat> I have felt that way and, and the children that I have raised uh, sometimes they're brutally honest back with me. Yes. But we've taught them to be honest and to express those emotions and I said, the only thing that I really have to repent for in my whole life is not telling the truth about my age all the time. 
uh, when you start out and you're young, if you can stay 20 as long as you can in the film industry, it works for you. And so I didn't want to give up the 20s, and then I got in the 30s, and then I got in the 40s, and I didn't want to get out of it. So it has been a process that continues today <laughs> at this very moment. So that is something that I have had a great deal of, of, well, not a problem. I chose to do it. I chose to be younger, feel younger, uh, behave younger, and not get um, uh, the stigma of being an old person. Of, of not having the energy, not having the enthusiasm. And I've tried to keep that. And fortunately, the, the products, the Kayani products, have assisted me. But I've also been through some of what you've been through. And I'm eager to read the book. Uh, who wouldn't need this? They didn't maybe have to go through the sexual abuse. It's but... good for anyone who has anything to heal from. I have a daughter who read my manuscript. And she's never been abused. And she is a sweetheart. And she's and one of the most loving people you will ever meet. And she has nine children, singles, but nine children. And she said to me, I will never be the same after having read this book. She says, there's things in here for everyone. And she says, "You, I have changed my life because of what I've read. Wow. So that daughter, meant a daughter lot. Daughter to a mother, mm -hmm. that means a great deal. It meant a lot. And her daughter, who is just... She's so in intellectual, but she's so sweet, too. I mean, she's just a sweetheart, loves everyone. Every little kid loves her, but she is so knowledgeable. And she has read books from the time she was little, practically a book a day, you know. And she picked up the book and read the first two chapters and came out to her mother and said, I didn't know Grandma was such a writer. <laughs> That's so a, that meant that meant something. Meant a lot to me. Well, so now you've done this. You're going to write another book. Um, uh, well, that's not where my are folks. you in your life right now. What is it that you feel like you can accomplish? I'm so proud of you. I have to say this on the air. I am simply proud of you that you've put all of this together. That you had the courage to then put it down on paper, not only for yourself but the people that perhaps. It will be so meaningful, too, to read your words and to feel your um, hurt and your pain. And we need to talk just a second about energy because you've gotten uh, a recently well, licensed. I, I just yeah, I suddenly gonna, remembered that. Don't forget that. So talk about that. That's what I was going to do okay. because that's my passion now. And I think um, the book has been kind of quiet. It hasn't done a lot. But my youngest daughter said, it's the timing of the universe, Mother. And uh, and then I called, and then things and, began to happen. And well, and I got certified as an energetic practitioner, which releases that emotional baggage that took me years of therapy to release. I can release in so minutes. So you, you are licensed. Can people get hold of you mm -hmm. by the email, and you work with them one on one, or in a group, or how do you work? I this? can work one on one. We can do it in a group. I can do it by proxy. Uh, I can do it for someone in Japan. And, uh, and so I'm it's, here. It, these are words. These are what? It's uh, actually kinesiology muscle testing where you test the subconscious mind. And I need to say this is Dr. Bradley Nelson's The Emotion Code. And you can look at it on www.healerslibrary.com. It will tell about it. Healerslibrary.com. And there's okay. a KSL interview on Healers Library of them interviewing Dr. Bradley Nelson. And when I found this, and there's many modalities out there that are working with energy, and it's like God opened up the heavens and poured out all these different kinds, and they're all over the world, but this is the one that spoke to my heart. And I have released so much from myself that wasn't released with the therapy nor the impact training. And I've been able to work with my children and grandchildren, and it has just been fantastic, and I just love this work. I am just really thrilled with it because it can release it so quickly and you don't have to go through. So all this baggage that people have been carrying for years and guilt, unexplained lack of emotion or too much emotion, you really can work with them and help them yes. get rid of all of this yes. and blossom anew. Yes, and it's uh, the method is to you have to go through a series of ways to find out what the subconscious mind is willing to release, and then to release it, you use the governing meridian in the body and magnets, which draws all of that to the surface and releases it. Wow, 
And you can even have inherited trapped emotions, which I have done some that have been 30 and 40 generations back, and it releases that from all of those ancestors as well. Let's give your email again. It's uh, Puggy, P-U-G-G-I-E 37 at yahoo.com. Okay. My guest today has been Janice and uh, Janice Weinheimer. And I'm knocked out by her book and what she's talking about. And uh, would you like to come back and do this again? I would love to. That's my passion. Uh, it is. It's, <laughs> I can see where it would be. It certainly, I can't think of anybody this book would not affect. We appreciate your coming in, being thank with you. us. I want to thank Kent Borking for technical help and also Kurt Crosby. Thank you very much. I'm Pat Sheranian, inviting you to be with me at 9 o'clock every morning. Uh, on streaming video at noon on streaming video and radio KHQN 1480 on your AM dial. Thank you for being here and have a great day.